Good afternoon. It's Teresa. I normally get these videos out on Thursday. Today is Friday. Um, I've been in the hospital with COVID, so that's a good excuse. And I am much better. But today's teaching is John chapter 20, and it's all about resurrection. And I feel like I got resurrected from the dead in the hospital. So this teaching in chapter 20 has a lot of meaning for me. I want you to notice the sage bush behind me here. It's quite gloriously blooming. Texas finally started to get rain. And when it rains in Texas, the sage blossoms. It gets resurrected. Uh, you don't see any blossoms on it, but it's almost like overnight blossoms come and are gloriously blooming that's what happened with jesus his whole ministry comes to this climaxing point his resurrection and we're here today and we're going to study this chapter 20 says early on sunday morning while it was still dark mary magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Mary and several other women were coming. Uh, John doesn't tell us about anyone except Mary, but he does mention that Mary speaks as we later on. Uh, Mark, who got his information from his mother, uh, says that Mary Magdalene Mary, the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices. I believe the Lord laid it on these women's hearts to go do that. Other scriptures tell us that as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were taking Jesus' body down from the cross and putting it in the tomb, that Nicodemus had brought 700 pounds of aloe and spices and linens. But what the Jewish people would do is they would take these strips of linen cloth and they would soak them in aloe with spices. And then they would, it would have a sticky substance on these linen cloths. And they would wrap each arm going around and around and around all the way up. They would wrap from the feet up to the legs and then up through the torso, up to the neck. And then they had a separate cloth that they put on the head. Um, this wasn't, it was like a mummy, but it wasn't uh, like the Egyptians did when they made a mummy and took all the blood out of the body the Jewish people considered the blood to be very, very sacred. So they left it in the body and wrapped the body in these burial clothes. So the body was actually going to be real tightly bound, uh, except the head was different. It would have a different type of covering on it because the Jewish people believe that when a person died, that their spirit would hover around the body for three days. And so women would stay around the outsides of the tomb so that they could hear if someone, their spirit entered their body again and they really weren't dead. A lot of times I think people would go into a coma and they were thought to be dead. So the Jewish people believed after the fourth day, the body would start to decay and the spirit would go ahead and go on to either Hades or the bosom of Abraham, uh, knowing that the body was not inhabitable anymore. So Mary was a woman who probably loved Jesus uh, more than any of the other women, except maybe Jesus's mother. Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary, and, and she, she had been forgiven a lot. She had been um, in uh, an occupation that uh, sold her body, and she, she encountered Jesus, I guess, at one of his teachings. 
and she came to Jesus when he was at Simon the leper's house uh, having a banquet and uh, she fell at his feet and started kissing his feet and anointing his feet and and she she was just so grateful and Simon had chastised Jesus for letting a woman of such ill repute touch him and that he must not be a very good prophet or he would not have allowed that to happen. And he said, she who is forgiven much, loves much. And that's the whole story of Jesus, forgiveness and resurrection from your dead state in your sins. It's a very beautiful story. So she loved him very much. And Jesus was put in the ground right before the Sabbath started. And so on the Sabbath, Jesus' friends could not come and visit his tomb. They had to stay where they were in their homes. They couldn't travel more than, I think, 10 feet at one time when the Sabbath was there. And so they couldn't travel to the tomb. But the last watch in the morning, and that was in between 3 and 6 in the morning, Mary took out. And uh, these other women were with her. And she must have gone ahead of the other women because she got there first. Uh, other scriptures tell us that the women were discussing among themselves how they were going to roll that big stone away. There was a, a tr 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 trench in front of the tomb that a huge stone that was like seven feet tall was set down in and it would be rolled over the tomb to make sure that grave robbers didn't come in and animals didn't come in and disturb the tomb. And the, the Romans had actually also sealed this stone and to break a Roman seal was a punishable offense by death. And the Pharisees wanted the tomb sealed, the stone sealed to the tomb to make sure that what Jesus said was going to happen, and that was that he was going to rise up after the third day, did not happen. How they thought they could prevent that, I don't know. But as the women were going, they were discussing among themselves. John doesn't tell us that. John is interested in proving that Jesus is the resurrected life, and that's what he focuses on. And Jesus' ministry wasn't just to men. It was to women as well. Women were not counted as worthy. Neither were children. We've talked about this before. But that's not the way Jesus treated women. He treated women equal. And there were women disciples, just like there were men disciples, even though the men disciples are the ones that were talked about the most in the Bible. John reports that Mary got to the tomb first. She ran and found Simon Peter when she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She just immediately ran, ran to find Simon Peter. Even though Peter had denied Jesus three times, um, the followers of Jesus still looked to Peter as their leader. And they also acknowledged that John was the one that Jesus loved the most. He was the closest. He was a cousin to Jesus, grew up with Jesus. And he's the one that believed in Jesus more than the other disciples. Peter believed, but Peter was, um, he, he had to have more uh, convincing than John had to have. So she ran and found the Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, Remember, that's how John speaks of himself. And she said, they have taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple immediately started out for the tomb. They were both running. Peter was a lot older than John. John lived about 60 more years than Peter did. And... Uh, John says, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Um, must have been a little bit of competitiveness there between John and Peter because John has to put in there that he beat him there. But out of respect, he looked in, but he did not go in. 
He stooped in and looked and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Now, these linen, ra linen wrappings, they were not all unraveled. They were deflated as if, well, not as if, but Jesus had just gone right through these wrappings and they were just deflated down on that place where he had been laying, laid on the stone. There was a stone, it was, it was like a, a seat and that's where they laid um, a dead body. And um, he saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Now remember, it's still dark. While the cloth had covered Jesus' head, was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. I've heard two traditions on this. I've heard that um, in this culture, when you were at a, someone's house, you were a guest and you had a napkin, if you were gonna leave and maybe go to the restroom and come back, you would fold your napkin and leave it there at, beside your plate. But if you were completely done with your meal, you would crumple your napkin and, and put it in the plate. Well, Jesus was coming back and the napkin that covered his face was folded. A lot of symbolism here. The other thing that I've heard, I heard just yesterday and it, it troubles me. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you what it was. Um, one of the pastors that I listened to said that in this culture, that if you were pleased with your meal, you would crumple your napkin up and put it in your plate. And if you were not pleased or if your needs were not met in the meal, meal you would fold it and give a subtle um, message to your host that something wasn't quite, quite right, um, that the needs weren't met. And this preacher said Jesus' needs were not met uh, on earth. Um, I disagree with that. I think that Jesus' needs were met because he met the commission that the Father gave him to come to earth and give himself as a living sacrifice so that we could have our sins forgiven and we could have fellowship with the Father. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We could never be good enough to come before the Father because we disobey. But Jesus always accurately did everything the Father told him to do. So the disciple who reached the tomb first, that is John, also went in and he saw and believed for when they for then, at that moment, they still did not understand the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. They hadn't gotten those scriptures yet. And then they went home. And I want to uh, give you three words that in the Greek are mentioned here. When John first came and looked in, he saw. And uh, that is one Greek word. The Greeks have very detailed descriptions of the words that they use. And that word, um, I don't remember exactly what it is, it starts with an E, but it means to just simply observe. And so John, I'm sure they had torches and you know he leaned in and he was able to see that the linen cloths were flat and that the cloth was folded. Well, he, he just saw that Jesus was not there and that the linen cloths were there. And then Peter, just when he got there, he just went on in. Peter was a lot more uh, forceful and aggressive because he wanted to see for himself what was going on. And so he saw what was going on. This was a different word. Uh, it, our word theater, theato, theato, I think is this word that's in the Greek that means that, that you see what? Uh, what's going on. You see what's being depicted in theater. You're seeing a show and, and you see what's going on. But the last thing, the last word that is used here is describing what John saw. 
he understood what it meant. He believed that Jesus had resurrected. He remembered that Jesus had said he was going to be resurrected. And so he understood. And that word is Edom, uh, E-D-O-N. And John understood. Peter didn't quite understand. He, he saw what was happening. Uh, first time John looked, he just observed. Um, but the Greek gives us much more detail about what was exactly going on. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. Now, Peter and John left, and Mary is, she's just now gotten back. She didn't run as fast as Peter or John, and she gets back to the tomb, and she's, she's weeping. She's crying. This is her master. She loves Jesus more than anything, and he's dead. And, and now somebody's taken his body. Other scripture accounts tells us that she ran back and told them that somebody had taken his body. She didn't know who, but she just knew that the body was missing. And she didn't, you know, she didn't understand. So uh, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in. And she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, the angels cried out. And by the way, um, this is the only time in scripture we see angels sitting. It's almost like they were at that mercy seat that was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant where there was two angels on either side sitting and, and bowing. And then this is where God would come down and visit with the people. Okay, Jesus has made a way for the people to come to God. So it was a type of mercy seat. And they're sitting there. And they say, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Kind of a redundant question. I think it was to get Mary to think, redirect her thoughts. And she says, because they have taken away my Lord. She did not know who they were. And she said, I don't know where they have put him. And she turned to leave. And when she did, she saw someone standing there. But again, I want to remind you, it was dark. She's crying. She's got tears in her eyes. And it was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Whether Jesus veiled her eyes so that she couldn't recognize him at first or not, I don't know. Uh, I know that he veiled himself from the two uh, that were walking on the road to Emmaus um, after he was crucified. We talked about that last week. But she did not recognize him. And he says to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? Same question the angels had asked. Who are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener. And she said, Sir, if you've taken him away, just tell me where you've put him and I'll go get him. And she turns her back on him and turns back to the tomb. And she says, Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. How she was going to carry him, I don't know. But she loved him so much, she just wanted to get his body restored. She wanted things to be right. Um, it's usually the job of women to make sure that everything is right at a meal in the household. Uh, women have a great responsibility that a lot of times they're not acknowledged for. But I want to make sure everyone realizes Jesus revealed himself first to a woman. Jesus was born to a woman. And I think that speaks so much of Jesus's ministry. Women are very important in God's kingdom. Men are also. But this made a shift in culture. So Jesus then called out her name and said, Mary, I don't know if you've ever heard Jesus call your name. I have. And when you hear Jesus call your name, it means a lot. 
when I was in the hospital and I was really having a hard time breathing. Jesus didn't call my name Teresa. He called me something else. He called me Stephania. And he kept calling me that. And um, he told me to look it up. And I did. And it means she who wears the crown of victory. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was going to give me victory over that COVID. It was not time for me to die. That he knew exactly what was going on with me, just like Jesus knew exactly what was going on with Mary. But he wanted to redirect Mary's thoughts, just like Jesus was redirecting my thoughts, not on my inability to breathe, but on the crown of victory that he's already given me. He's already fought every battle that we come before, and he's given us victory. If we have asked Jesus into our life, he fought our battles on this cross. And then he was resurrected to show us how we will be resurrected from every battle with a crown of victory. So he calls out Mary, and she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is the Aramaic way to say, teacher, master. It's Hebrew for teacher. So she, she just immediately wants to grab him and hug him and not let go. And here again, we go back to the Aramaic text. We go to the Aramaic text this time because most people understand it as, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Well, that wasn't exactly what it meant in Aram Aramaic. In Aramaic, it said, I've got to ascend to my Father, but it's not time yet. Uh, he sent me to preach his gospel, and I'm sending you to preach my gospel. So stop clinging to me. Know, know that I am with you, and, I, and I'm going to go to the Father so I can be with you all the time. But for right now, you need to go spread the word that I've been resurrected. Peter preached a teaching of resurrection at Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. It was that resurrection teaching that is so powerful and so important. I am sitting here today. I only had COVID for four days, but I went into a very dark place. But God has restored me greatly. I'm not fully recovered, but I am recovering, and I'm very grateful for it. And she's recovering, too, from her tears. God doesn't want us to focus on the problem. He wants us to focus on the victory. That's what he wanted Mary to focus on. Not the empty grave, but on the victory he was bringing for her. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. She gave them the exact message he gave her to give to them, just like Jesus gave the exact message to us that God gave him. And it's very important that we give the exact message. Nothing added, nothing left out. There's a lot of translations that change things, but the Holy Spirit is inside of you. If you have Jesus in your heart and he can guide you into all truths, just like a moment ago when I told you I've heard two takes on that folded napkin. I told you the two takes because one of them is not true. And the Holy Spirit told me it was not true. And I debated whether or not to say it to you. But God told me to tell you and so I did. Jesus is coming back. That's why he folded his headgear. That Sunday evening, it was on a Sunday that Jesus resurrected I want to say one more thing about that. Until Jesus was resurrected, the Jewish followers, 
and Greek followers and Gentile followers celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. But after he was resurrected, they started celebrating the Sabbath on Sunday, Resurrection Day. In fact, the Aramaic term is Resurrection Day. And um, it then became the Sabbath. And um, that Sunday evening that all this took place that morning, early that morning before daybreak, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They were afraid that they would come and get them and crucify them as well. So they were meeting, but in secret. And they were in that upper room that, that Jesus had had his Passover supper in. Suddenly, Jesus appeared among them. He didn't have to go through a door. Remember, the door was locked. Jesus' body, when it was resurrected, was in a different form than it was on earth before he was crucified. Uh, scripture gives us really clear information that when we get resurrected bodies, they're going to be our bodies at their very best. I have a lot of wrinkles on my body now because I'm 68 years old. But when my body is resurrected, uh, it's going to be a much ver younger version of me. People are always wanting to be younger. Well, we're going to be uh, at just the right time. There is no fountain of youth that's going to give that. I don't care how much moisturizer you put on your face. It's not going to make those wrinkles go away. I have clients that come that have had facelifts. They do not look like themselves. They do not look like they looked in their younger years. Their skin is all stretched. Um, but they think it's going to make them feel better. And the doctors make a lot of money. Same thing with all the other body sculptures that people get. They're, they're wanting a quick fix for the way they don't like their body. But God allows these bodies to age. They're supposed to age. And they're supposed to be sloughed off. These bodies are going to die. I didn't know if it was my time to die or not. And God let me know. Nope got some more stuff for you to do so here I am doing it so the first thing Jesus says is peace be with you and that term in Hebrew means may you have all good things as he spoke he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side and they were filled with joy and they saw the Lord they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Now, remember I said that he had a resurrected body that was better than the body that was he inhabited when he was teaching on earth. But he has his wounds for one man. We're fixing to learn about that. Again, he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We need Jesus, and Jesus needs us to continue his work here on earth. We are his hands, his feet, his mouths, his everything. He sends us out to spread the resurrection story that we can be forgiven of our sins and have total connection with the Father. Then he breathed on them. Remember when God created Adam, he formed him from the dust of the earth, and then he blew, blew his breath into him. And when he blew his breath into Adam, Adam came alive. And so Jesus is breathing his breath. It's the breath of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to prepare them to go out, to understand and then in the next book that we're going to be studying about here in two weeks in Acts, we learn that Jesus actually sends back his Holy Spirit to inhabit them and empower them to do all kinds of things, just exactly like Jesus did. But right now, he's giving them a preview. He's breathing his breath 
and the Hebrew word for breath is spirit. So he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now that doesn't mean that we individually have the power to forgive someone's sins. I mean, yes, if they harm us and they ask us to forgive them, we can forgive them. But God gives us the power to discern whether or not that person is truly repentant in their heart because God knows when you are and when you aren't. And he gives us a knowing as to whether or not that person is truly repentant about what they've been doing. And so to share that gospel of forgiveness to a person that we know is not truly repentant, it's just not the right time. So that's what this passage means. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. God is giving us the ability to, to know that. One of the 12 disciples named Thomas, Didymus was his um, other name, his Greek name. It, it means twin. He was not with the others when Jesus came. He was very hurt when Jesus was crucified. He was the one that when Jesus said he was going to go back, said, well, I guess we'll just go back and die with you. Uh, he only saw the crucifixion as a way of death. He didn't see the resurrection. And so rather than staying with the other disciples and sharing his grief with them, he went off to grieve alone. And there's a lot of people that do that. They do not allow themselves to receive the support of others when they're in dis distress. I texted a lot of people and told them I was in the hospital and asked them to pray. Not that I didn't believe that God wouldn't hear my prayers, but I also, also know that one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000. And you can be sure there was a spiritual battle going on in my life at that time for my life, but wasn't the right time. Just like Jesus kept saying, it's not my time. It's not my time. And he would disappear and he wouldn't be killed when the Jewish leaders were trying to stone him. Well, it wasn't my time. My time is determined by God the Father. So, he, did, he wasn't there with them on that first Sunday. And uh, when he came back around, they told him, we've seen the Lord, that he was a pessimist. I don't know if he thought they were trying to pull the wool over his eyes or what, but he said, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Whoa, that's pretty radical. Now, this doesn't say anything about nails in the feet. And nothing in Scripture says that Jesus' feet were nailed to the cross. Um, I realized that in studying this this time. And, and all my life, I've always thought that there was nails that were put in his feet. But there really isn't anything in Scripture to validate that. The Romans would tightly bind people's feet to the bottom of the cross as it was on that little scaffolding that they could push themselves up on. But uh, it's not said that they nailed Jesus' feet. Now, sometimes the Romans did nail the feet, but usually they, they tied them. Um, eight days later, the disciples were there together again, and this time Thomas was with them, and the doors were locked. But suddenly, just like before, Jesus was standing among them. And again, he says, peace be with you. All good things be brought to you. And Jesus is a very good thing. Then he looked at Thomas and said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. There's a passage in the Bible that says we walk by faith, not sight. Thomas was walking by sight. Only what he could see with his own eyes would he believe. And so this was the reason I believe that Jesus when he was resurrected, had the nail prints in his hand and the wound in his side to prove he was the one that was crucified. And Thomas was just so humbled. He said, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, you believe because you've seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And that's called believing by faith. And that's where we come in. We believe by faith. 
The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written in this book this is what John says, so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life, resurrected life, by the power of his name. Oh, that is so powerful. I believe this is the most powerful scripture in the Bible, the most powerful chapter this one that John wrote because it tells completely of the resurrection of Jesus. When I was in the hospital, God told me, do not fear what man can do to you. See, I, I don't do drugs very well. And the doctors, they were respecting my not wanting drugs and they were giving me natural things and uh, they got me well, they were enough. Uh, but they also given me intravenous IVs of things that made my system go out of whack even more. Um, my sodium was really low. They gave me too much sodium. It got my sodium level up too high, which is a very dangerous thing. Then they started giving me sugar water intravenous, intravenously to bring it back down, but it wouldn't bring it back down. So, um, they weren't going to be able to adjust my body, but God did. I'm not supposed to fear what man can do to me if I have God within me, if I have him giving me victory. And I did, and I do. I'm so grateful to God for what Jesus did on the cross. I'm so grateful that God resurrected Jesus. That was his plan all along and gives us the ability to be resurrected from everything we go through. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be able to take a deep breath. I'm grateful for John's gospel. I'm grateful to be in my garden doing this video. I love you all. I'll be with you next week. John has one more chapter. It's chapter 21. It's kind of a summary. And I will see you next week in the garden. And hopefully my voice will be back to normal. <laughs> Y'all take care.